Election season is upon us, friends, and on November 6, you will be asked to vote for your state representative in the 5th Barnstable District. I'm Greg Anderson, here at the home of Jack Stanton in East Sandwich. He is the Democratic candidate in that race. Let's go inside. Let's talk to Jack, learn a little bit more about him and his race. Jack Stanton, welcome to the program. Um, so here's what I gotta say, you're 27 years old. When I was 27, I don't even think I knew how to spell state representative. <laughs> what is pulling a young guy like you into a race like this? Um, I get asked this a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one thing I will say is, you know, if, if I were lucky enough to be elected, I, I would not be the youngest up there. So, so that's, okay, that's, that's worth noting. Um, yeah. Actually, two of the other members of the Cape delegation, uh, Julian Sear and uh, Representative Fernandez, uh, are, are, are both um, millennials. So uh, it's not without precedent, uh, okay. especially for our region as well. Good. But um, yeah, I, I decided to run for office just because out of a, a profound sort of frustration with the sort of toxicity we see. Um, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on politically, I think we can all agree that the current environment that we're seeing at the national level is uh, extremely rancorous and extremely uh, unsettling. Yeah. I mean, you turn on the TV, I mean, your stomach churns yeah. um, from, from some of these headlines. And um, I think politics are extremely important. Uh, and it's unfortunate to see people getting turned off to politics when, you know, when we talk about the issues that impact all of us as Cape Codders, we all kind of tend to care about the same stuff. It's relatively nonpartisan. And um, I think there's a case to be made that uh, this region could be better represented at the state level. Yeah. Um, I think there's this sort of stereotype that Cape Cod is a wealthy vacation destination. It's not for those who, who live here year round. And um, I think that given all of the challenges that are facing this region mm -hmm. and the shared concerns we all have as Cape Codders, um, it was a good time to step forward and, and give it a run. How's the campaign going? We got a couple more weeks as we're taping this today. Um, how's uh, more than that? Um, how is the um, campaign going in general? Uh, uh, I wish I could have some sort of metric of, of uh, knowing how I was doing. Yeah. We're working very, very hard. Um, I've knocked on thousands of doors since, since starting this campaign back in late June. Um, I was able to get a significant amount of time off for work uh, for this last month stretch mm -hmm. uh, between now and, and the election and um, all I can say is we're going to keep knocking doors every day talking to as many folks as we can and uh, trying to take forward those new ideas and that uh, message that we're trying to resonate across the district. Um, so I don't know to answer your question yeah. how, how I'm doing. But feels good? Feels good. Yeah, You're hearing I mean, I'm good starting things? to show up at doors and people actually yeah. know who I am. And, uh, I think that shows that you know what we're doing is working, that we're getting out there in the community, and uh, you know we've been well received everywhere we've gone. Well, speaking of uh, knocking on doors, thank you for letting us into your home today. It's a, <laughs> sure. a beautiful home. Um, I, I my GPS uh, had me lost, so I was knocking on every single door. <laughs> Am I at the right place? Knocking it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's yeah, it's tiring, but uh, I you know hats off. I have family that have run for office in town elections and and done very well, but man, it is a hard. John, and you're working too. It's really hard. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, the I, end of September through now, I, I took off from work, but starting with the beginning of the season in April, I've started working on an offshore lobster boat out of the basin here in Sandwich, which yeah. has been a fascinating experience. Um, I mean, it's, it's the hardest job I've ever had. Yeah. Know, it's a very sort of parochial local job. Yeah. Um, but I've learned a lot and it's been a, a tremendous experience doing so. so. We're going to talk a little bit about your experience and what kind of brings you to today. Sure. Uh, but let's, let's talk a little bit about your platform. Um, there are really four areas that I saw on your website, you know, pay increases, no more pay increases for public officials, mm -hmm. technology reform, particularly as it relates to um, technology's role in eliminating waste and fraud in, in government, funding elections, making sure that the average guy mm -hmm. can run without big corporate uh, America kind of swallowing up any opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see that one. And of course, you mentioned state holidays uh, for uh, election days as a way to encourage people to, mm -hmm. to show up. Being a guy that works every day, I know exactly what you're talking about. Geez, I wish I could get off of work so I can uh, go vote. Um, how did you arrive at these priorities? Why these priorities? Um, I took a holistic look at what I saw wrong in, in our current system. Um, 
I've always been politically engaged. I've always followed the news um, as someone who studied a heavy amount of political science and comparative politics. My concentration at George Washington University was international affairs with a concentration in comparative political, economic, and social systems. So uh, identifying areas where things aren't working well and trying to find ways where we could improve them. Um, at the state level here in Massachusetts, Massachusetts is a great state. It's a great place to live. And I, I think when you look at a lot of specific areas, Massachusetts leads the nation. Um, with that said, uh, I think there are a lot of areas where we can do better. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were some areas where I, I saw uh, problems that I think could be uh, resolved with, with some new ideas. So. You also speak to environmental protection, transportation, and um, housing. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in your October 10th uh, Cape Cod Times opinion piece, you write these three components, those in particular, quote, all require a long-term approach, a vision um, for that. Help me, Jack, to unpack that a little bit. Let's, sure. let's almost anecdotally or factually or, or literally, if you could, let's talk about these. Uh, environmental uh, protection, um, being a Cape Codder, we're clearly focused on the environment here, but um, talk about long-term approach and vision. Explain that for me. Sure. Um, I think when it comes to when we approach our environment, uh, we have to understand, first of all, that here on Cape Cod, our environmental health is very much tied into our economic health. These are not mutually exclusive concepts. Um, they're, they're tied in with each other, and so we have to kind of look to our environment as something that uh, is not only something that should be preserved, but we have to look to the challenges of the future and what we can be doing now to mitigate some of those challenges. So one thing that comes to mind is climate change. Um, the, there was a UN report that came out in the past week that said that we have 15 years to get emissions under control to limit uh, warming by 1.5 degrees. 1.5 degrees can have profound impacts across, across the planet. But here, when we localize it on Cape Cod, um, increased storm strength and sea level rise are the two things that come to mind. This place is going to look very, very different 50 to 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about time we start preparing for that now, starting having conversations on what can we do to help shore up our infrastructure um, to make it so our communities are more safe? What can we do in terms of uh, environmental protection so that people who have certain livelihoods on which they depend are around in the future? Um, so when we talk about sustainable fisheries, when we talk about aquaculture, I mean, these are uh, good livelihoods that folks here on the Cape have, and uh, we need to pursue policies which are going to enable people to continue to work in that vein. Climate change, uh, Massachusetts uh, is one of the parts of the country as a coastal state that is most predisposed to it. Over 20% of, of Sandwich alone's tax base lays in a flood zone. Uh, parts of, 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 of this town, um, with the recent storms this past winter, uh, suffered a lot of property damage. Mm -hmm. um, what happens when these these properties, were, which are the base of our which are the base of our municipal Taxes are no longer worth uh, what they are anymore. Sure. That's going to be a huge long-term problem. Uh, when you saw some of the marshes that overflowed uh, parts of, of, of 6A and, and uh, th these recent storms, um, you had parts of town, here in East Sandwich in particular, um, which were totally cut off from the rest of town. If you wanted to get an ambulance out here, you couldn't because parts of 6A were six feet underwater. Um, long-term approach to some of these problems and, and not looking about the next budget cycle, not looking about the next uh, election cycle, but actually looking into the future and identifying uh, current trends and policies which are going to ameliorate, uh, remediate some of the problems that are going to come. So. Let's talk about transportation. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about what a long-term approach uh, or that vision really needs to be in your mind. Sure. Um, I think people need to realize that transportation affects everything. If, if climate change is going to be such a big impact, we need to take cars off the road. We have to make it so people can get around the state easier. Right now, when I look at Cape Cod, I see a huge problem. We are a state that is, we are a region that is within 60 miles of Boston that is not currently well served by the MBTA. Um, there's a high cost of living down here. People have a hard time. Uh, finding housing and affording housing. Mm -hmm. Yet you have a lot of high wage jobs that are getting created in the Boston area, jobs that pay a lot better than jobs down here on the Cape. We can't get people to those jobs with our current transit system. If I want to go take the commuter rail to Boston, I have to drive 35 minutes to Kingston mm -hmm. and, and hope that there's no traffic and you're going to have to be going pedal to the metal to get there right. in that 35 and, minutes. And oh, by the way, there's a bridge. In and, by, and by yeah. the way, there's a bridge. So <laughs> exactly. there's no traffic. Um, right. We have tracks that 
are, are in suitable condition that lead to, to, to Buzzards Bay. Why don't we have commuter rail there? This community, the Upper Cape, has more in common with Dorchester than we do with a community like Provincetown or Wellfleet when it comes to being a suburb of Boston. And I think that it's about time that we have some uh, transit-oriented development which reflects that reality, connecting Don't. people's jobs. Sure. And, to, and, and to, to further answer your question with regards to transportation as a whole, let's yeah. have a conversation as a state of looking what our state's going to look like in the next 50 years, modernizing our rail system, fixing the T. Um, some of these cars are 30, 40 years old. Um, it's going to require a lot of money, it requires a lot of investment, and these are not things that are going to crop up overnight, but the, you have to start the conversation and figure out what kind of state do we want to be, what do we want to look like in the future. Right. You have a, a lot of economic activity concentrated in the Boston area, you have western parts of the state that are left behind. We should have a conversation about developing high-speed rail to make it so you can get across this state uh, efficiently and effectively. Um, when I when I think of that, um, I, there's a lot that I can resonate uh, with. There, there's you know driving in the car and getting from point A to point B, and you know Boston is so close, but it's so far away. On, on Over so two hours, two hours at least, usually for a commute, right? Yeah. Like you're banging your head on the steering wheel, exactly. you get past the Braintree split, and. She's like, okay. Have you seen me driving? Because I do bang my head on the steering wheel. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's quite embarrassing, office, it's like actually. That, that scene from Office it, it, at the beginning. It, it, exactly. The person in the walker going alongside right. the car, and, and the person. <laughs> but 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 Jack, is it, doesn't that seem a little uh, pie in the sky, yeah, far-fetched, idealistic? Yeah. 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 Like yeah. nothing. I mean, again. These things aren't going to happen overnight, but yeah. I'm, I'm not seeing even the conversation getting started, and that's 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 a problem. Um, we're as Americans, we've done some pretty unbelievable things when you mobilize people, when you put public pressure on a system to achieve a certain outcome. Right. Um, I think people are disenchanted with politics. I think that people's expectations of what uh, our political system can do are, are very very low, and, and, and with good reason. Um, with that said, I think it's important that collectively we identify a future that is going to be one which we can have some sense of ownership in. Right. And, and we should have high expectations on behalf of our elected officials to act on our best wishes, on our best interests. That concept of the public good, I think, is kind of lost on a lot of folks. Um, your public officials should be acting in the best interests of everyone, and I don't see that right now. Housing is also an issue that you, you brought up, um, you know, in Sandwich, but it, actually in the, in, in the fifth Barnstable district, mm -hmm. housing prices are pretty high, taxes are pretty high. How does, how does housing fit into your, into your vernacular? It's a huge problem. I mean, down here, when I look at just, the, well, this is the house that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm still living with my parents because when you look at the housing market down here, um, it's very, very difficult to find an affordable house. Uh, and it's even in the rental market. I mean, I look at, you know, friends of mine that I grew up with, they'll cram into a winter rental in the winter time and then they move back into their parents in the summer mm -hmm. because they're paying down student debt or they're trying to save up for a house of their own. I have a friend who makes over $90,000 a year. If he wanted to, he probably could uh, afford a house down here, but he has student debt that he's paying off. He's trying to do the responsible thing and, and, and trying to save up for his future. Um, workforce housing is a huge problem down here. You have people that come down here in the summer, that we need, workers that we need that you know, can't afford a place to live. Mm. And in terms of a community, what you're seeing is that you're seeing people are priced out. So there's no younger families that are replacing the population as, as people age. People leave the Cape and they don't come back. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of a demographic uh, time bomb. I mean, Cape Cod is one, I think, it, I believe, don't quote me on this exactly, but I believe it is the second yeah, oldest. Just between <laughs> you and me, there are not three cameras in your <laughs> kitchen right now. It's roughly the second oldest uh, community on the eastern seaboard outside of Miami-Dade County. It's a very old population and uh, younger families aren't choosing to settle here because of, of the, those sort of realities. Mm -hmm. Cape Cod's a great place to grow up, it's a great place to raise a family and uh, the current housing market as it currently stands makes it very difficult for families to be able to do so. 2010 graduate of Sandwich High School uh, you went to D.C. to study at George Washington University, uh, as you had said. You clearly have uh, far more education than me. 
uh, because really this is all about me and how I compare to you and you compare to me and I'm feeling this big right about now as it relates to your education and your you traveled the world. You have you were very young, but you have a lot of experience um, internationally. Mm -hmm. um, here, you and I are sitting at your your kitchen table talking about the Jack Stanton that wants to become our state representative. How does all of this worldly experience, if you will, professional and personal, sure. bring you to being a state rep? <sighs> um, Loaded question, I know. Yeah. Uh, Look, I, I grew up in a small town, uh, as you know. Luke Sandwiches is a wonderful place to grow up, but it's, 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 it's a sheltered community. Um, I didn't cross the bridge much growing up. I didn't really have an opportunity to travel much growing up. With that said, I, I did a lot of reading. I was very, very uh, active in school, and I was really, really curious about what was sort of on the outside. Um, my dad was uh, a merchant mariner growing up, so he would ship out uh, up until I was around five, six years old. I remember him going away months at a time, and he'd go out to all different foreign, play faraway lands, and, wow. um, and it always had me kind of curious um, about the outside world. And so uh, I had a very strong interest in, in international affairs, foreign relations. Uh, I was a, a big model UN nerd in, in, in high school. And uh, when it came down to making a decision for college, I kind of had these two paths laid out in front of me. I was actually considering going to a service academy. Um, was very, very close to going to the Coast Guard Academy. And at the last minute, I uh, ended up deciding to go to George Washington University, follow my passion to study international affairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, with GW, it really just kind of opened my eyes to the world. Um, I was enrolled in the Elliott School of International Affairs. It's one of the only undergraduate colleges specifically dedicated to international affairs in the world. Um, I had classmates from all across the country, all over the world. And so that really opened my eyes to sort of uh, diversity of thought, uh, diversity of uh, opinions. And uh, through being enrolled in that school, uh, I got a global education by being in an international city at an international mm. university, but I also got to spend a lot of time overseas uh, in class. So my whole junior year in college, I, I spent overseas. I spent a semester studying uh, international development in Dakar, Senegal, in West Africa, mm. where I uh, lived with a Senegalese family. I had an internship in some of the uh, challenged communities uh, in, in Dakar. Uh, I took most of my classes in French because I started learning French late in high school here. And that was a transformational experience and really shaped how yeah. I viewed the world. My spring semester I spent on exchange at a French university in Paris, Sciences Po. Um, after I graduated, I got a job in the development sector. I worked two contracts at, at the World Bank, uh, the sort of financial arm of the United Nations. Um, I had a brief uh, teaching stint in, in Cairo, Egypt. I did some backpacking in, in Peru. And most recently, I was working for a research consultancy in Mozambique in Southern Africa. Um, I kind of took advantage of these experiences because I was young and I was curious and, and I wanted to see uh, how the world worked and, and wanted to be a part of, of, of stuff on the outside to share those experiences and see how it could shape my perspective. And so what that brings back to here locally is um, perspective being exposed to, to different ways of thought, being uh, able to uh, learn other people's stories, uh, learn what forces people to come to certain positions of opinion. And uh, I think I've got you know, two things I can take from that. Um, it's allowed me to be a very, very good listener and to be very, very tolerant and understanding that everybody comes from different experiences and you have to have some sort of um, you know, empathy and being able to understand people and where they come from. And, and, and also to understand that this is a really special place. Um, the, life, the life that I had growing up here in Sandwich was a very, very privileged one. Um, and I think that most folks who grew up here are, under, are very aware of that. Mm. Um, you become even more so aware when, when you actually see uh, how other people live across this world. And um, what I see in, in my own community is that uh, it's changed in a lot of different ways, for, for the worse, in, in, in my lifetime. And um, knowing how many opportunities I've had by being able to grow up in a place like this, I, I want other you know, working families to be able to come here and start a life and be able to benefit from the wonderful opportunities that this community is able to provide. So. I'll tell you, Jack, while you were talking about what you did as a junior in, in college, uh, when I was a junior in college, I was like on Mass Ave in Boston, <laughs> um, getting wrecked at a bar. 
Um, so I, my, my hats off uh, to you. Again, it's a spelling thing. I don't even know how to spell half of what you just said as it relates to where you've been. But, um, but it, it's interesting that how you tick and tie that to exposure and awareness uh, because one could deduce that uh, a little bit of the same old, same old can uh, bring on conditional blindness. You know, I just don't see the things that are really important out there because the perspective might not be there. And that's in companies, that's in politics and, and the like. As you mentioned earlier, you know, you're running at a time where there is significant political um, divisiveness in this country, national and local. On your website, you do refer to um, a quote, deep concern about the toxicity of the national political climate. and and the collective frustration that people have towards their government. How does a vote for Jack Stanton mitigate or address that issue? Um, I'm trying to run a very positive issues-oriented campaign focused on the things that matter to all of us as Cape Codders. Um, I've gotten support from Republicans, I've gotten support from Democrats, I've gotten support from those who identify, who don't identify with any political party. Um, I am running to hopefully force a conversation on issues that are of issue of consequence to us all. And I'm trying to hopefully be an example to other younger folks who are disenchanted with the system and don't believe in the system that uh, we all should take an interest and focus on what we can actually agree on because it's more than one would think. And I think in a race like this, which is, is not a federal office, you'll find that there are, there's more you can do with people from different sides of the spectrum that you share in common with regards to you know, trying to find ways where you can improve your community. So. It sounds like you're, you're talking in vague generalities, but okay. we're also talking about um, you're running against a four-term state rep incumbent, mm -hmm. um, a Republican. Um, you know, at a time of this, of this divisiveness, um, let me play devil's advocate. One sure. could argue and say, geez, you know, while our, our country is just ripping apart at the seams of, of, of dramatic uh, proportions, uh, one could argue that perhaps being established, knowing the ropes, knowing how to play Be Beacon Hill, um, is an, is an advantageous opportunity for us um, here in this, in this district. Um, it therefore, is now the time to have a newcomer. And if it's you, uh, let's be specific. What would your learning curve be? Everyone has a first day on the job is sort of my, my response to that. Um, there's a learning curve with everything. But when we look at Beacon Hill, Mm -hmm. and the legislature and, and how it functions. Um, first of all, with regards to the challenges impacting the region, I'm, I'm confident in uh, discussing them with a certain measure of fluidity. I have an understanding of what the issues are impacting the region, and I know what, uh, what I would be fighting for and what my goals would be. So I would have a focus. That's, we have that. But you get put into a chamber where there's 159 other <laughs> representatives sure. representing different districts, different interests, and it's your opportunity to fight with everybody else to get resources to get brought back to your district. Obviously, there's an advocacy piece, too, where you're trying to advocate on certain broader right. level policies you want to get passed. But at the end of the day, you're fighting for your district. You're fighting for your community. Um, those sort of measures move forward by relationships. Because mm -hmm. you have to interact with all these different people from different parts of the state who have different views in order to deliver resources for your district. And I think that by virtue of sort of the experiences I've had uh, here in this community and outside, I'm able to work with people with different opinions, uh, that I have the communication skills and these sort of uh, active listening skills to be able to work with others towards shared goals. And uh, I think that you know, if given the opportunity, I would really, really excel in, in that sort of an environment. Um, energy is important. Um, it's legislative, legislative work is very frustrating uh, and can kind of make people prone to cynicism. But, you know, I've been working on an offshore lobster boat while campaigning. It's been extremely arduous. It's been tiring. But, again, I have a focus that I'm working towards. And I think even just 
by running this campaign the way I have, it should be an example or a testament to my, my capacity to stay focused and work hard in pursuit of a goal. Are we lacking energy? And this is a, a direct, um, you know, uh, a, a direct commentary of your opponent. But are we lacking energy as it relates to our legislative um, uh, advocacy and represent, representation on Beacon Hill? Yes. Okay. Uh, I like I like the simplicity of your answer. Um, let's let's switch gears. Young or old, mm -hmm. the opioid crisis is just choking. I mean, not only Cape Cod, but also the um, you know the country. Um, on the other side of the aisle from you, Governor Baker has made it a talking point in his campaign. Mm -hmm. um, Randy Hunt has made it a, a talking point in his campaign. Um, I, I didn't see much of that in your literature, but I'm going to I'm going to talk to the youth thing. Your generation is really taking it on the chin as it relates to these d deaths of, of young and old, but the, the youth. Um, talk to me a little bit about, about your, uh, your interest in that topic and what you can do to lend a voice to that crisis. Sure. Um, you will see it on my website. It is in my literature. It's one of the most profound crises we face here on Cape Cod. Um, it's personal for me. I, I have not even had my first high school reunion yet. I was my class president, so I, was, I have to plan this sort of a thing, and I've already lost a classmate. Um, there's not a single family in this community who has not either been directly or indirectly touched by this crisis. Um, my frustration comes from the fact that there are lots of people in our current system who slip through the cracks. People who genuinely want help uh, are not able to get it. Um, right now, a month of outpatient care is considered a long time in, in, in treatment. And quite frankly, it, it takes five, six months longer. I mean, it's a lifetime of recovery, but five, six months of really intensive mm -hmm. attention to get care. Um, if, if you're on, uh, if you don't have insurance, there's really no, no, no path for you. If you're underinsured, uh, I mean, there, there are people who are on mass health that, that can't even get access to treatment. Um, treatments are also n notoriously expensive, and, yeah. and, and if you can get a bed. And so I, I think that uh, the governor and this administration and the legislature have, have made measured gains, and, and we, we should applaud them for that. But we should not be satisfied because there's so much more we can do. Um, I think on one end, uh, in, in dealing with treatment, um, we need to start a conversation on moving to a single-payer health system so people don't fall through the cracks. There was a woman the other night who I spoke with at the West Barnesville Civic Association Forum, and she was taking care of uh, children from uh, you know, former addicts. And you know, she was a foster mother and she said, you know, where, where are the resources for people like me? Where mm. are the resources for, for grandparents who, who, are, who are raising children? It's that uh, ripple where, effect. Where, yeah, I mean, entire families are destroyed by this. Families that you know, have to, you know, financially ruin themselves to help pay for some of these treatments. Um, and I think that structuring our health system under a multi-payer system as opposed to a single payer, which you know, would cover everyone at a fraction of the cost, people slip through those cracks and, and that's a problem with treatment. I think we also have to look at these pharmaceutical companies and, 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 and you know, taking them to court because they were able to peddle poison over the course of many, many years and addict large groups of people. That's, that's outrageous and, and you know, we should be very, very strident in, in, in seeking recourse with them. Um, I think also there, in terms of education and prevention, um, it's less than 2% of, of substance abuse spending that we have right now. And so we really have to identify our priorities, also identify a lot of our deficiencies. Um, uh, over 60% of the people who've had an overdose down here uh, only have a high school education. Mm. Um, the CAPE is very much an incubator for uh, people who are affected by this crisis. And we have to kind of take a look at why that is down here and it's you know connecting a lot of dots there is no one input and output which is going to solve this problem sure. it's sort of a, a very inter interconnected with a lot of different uh, societal factors but there's a lot of difficult conversations we need to have and we need to listen to those people who are in this community who have recovered 
uh, to hear their voices about you know, what is not getting done to address their concerns. Because there's a lot of folks who I've talked to that I grew up with that do not feel like their concerns are getting heard. And there is an entire industry that uh, you know, benefits from, from these people who are seeking treatment. And I think that we really need to take a holistic approach of, of uh, solving this problem, which includes listening to those folks um, who, who've been impacted either directly or, or indirectly. Again, it's a societal problem we have. Sure. W more work to be done. So much more work to be done. Jack, uh, for you to get elected, you need to not only capture those diehard uh, Democrats mm -hmm. that are in, in this district. Uh, in Sandwich alone, you got about 3,000, just over 3,000 of those. Uh, but also those registered independents, of which there are 9,700 in Sandwich alone, your, your, your hometown. Uh, and uh, Republicans, about 2,800 in, in Sandwich. Those latter two groups, how do you appeal to them um, and to this profile of voter? Why would they cast your name at the ballot? So, Independents the, and Republicans. The issues that I'm running on, again, are, are nonpartisan in nature. Um, they're things that matter to all of us as Cape Codders. And I think that y you could make a case to these voters that you know we can do better and that sort of identifying a vision a future for this place that is going to be more inclusive and and uh, take seriously out of the challenge that challenges that we're facing people may be willing to take a chance on on something different that's that's my hope um, I, I'm running on issues at like education, transportation, the environment. There's things we all care about as, as, as Cape Codders. And so uh, I don't think that this sort of uh, red, blue, black, white, left, right uh, sort of uh, way of hacking up our, uh, your, your electoral choices mm -hmm. uh, matters as much at, at the local level. Again, I've had po folks from both parties who have been said they've been willing to support me. And, uh, you know, I, I can only keep talking about the issues, staying positive and, and hoping that folks may come our way. Does it surprise you when you get a far right Republican? I'm assuming maybe maybe this is what you're referring to, a far right Republican, maybe a traditional Randy Hunt voter supporter that says, I think I am ready for a change. Does that surprise you or no, no. why does it not surprise you? Because people right now are frustrated with our political system across the board. They want change. They want something that's different. I talked to one guy in East Sandwich uh, a couple weeks ago. We were canvassing off of uh, Plowed Neck Road and uh, registered Republican. When we go door to door, I've got the voter file, so I know who I'm talking to before mm -hmm. I go up to the door. Or at least, you know, my campaign manager will know. Sometimes right. he doesn't tell me, especially if you're ever going up to what could be more hostile yeah, household. Yeah, but right. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to they're anybody. They're fine. Just go on up. No, yeah, no, you, I, you go I, first. Look, I, I, I will right. talk to anybody right. and, and I will fight for, for every single vote that, that I can. Um, so this guy was a registered Republican, he's working on his car, we start, we start chatting, and uh, he said, you know, I'm a registered Republican, I gave him my spiel, I'm a registered Republican, but you know what, the way things are going right now, I just don't care, I just, I, I just want something that's different. Um, I went to town hall last week and I asked for a list of all my elected officials so I could vote against every single one of them, no matter no what kidding. political party they were a member of. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I said, thank you. I, I appreciate yeah. <laughs> you offering me your vote. So Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, as we wrap up uh, in, in time, Jack, um, this is truly that silly age question. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that you're 27 years old. Sure. You're young. You're you, you do have energy and, and interest in, in being politically active. Um, so it kind of begs the question, where do you see yourself in five or 10 years? I mean, are you, are you going, is politics your thing? Is, or is this really kind of where you are today? So I got asked this question uh, at the group I spoke at just prior to, to, to coming here. Yeah. Um, I think I don't like people going out and saying, all right, I'm getting ready to start my political career. I'm getting ready to, uh, get my feet wet in politics. I think politicians need to be understanding of the fact that every election they can lose. I think every election should be a competition. I think that that's a good thing for our democracy. And so I, I can't look five years down the line to tell you what I'm going to be doing because I don't know what I'm going to be doing three weeks down the line mm -hmm. <laughs> after this election. Um, I think people need to understand that it's a tremendous privilege 
to be able to go and represent your community, in this case, 42,000 people up at the state level. Um, this seat is a public trust. It doesn't belong to anyone, no, regardless of how long someone has been there. And at the ballot box every November, uh, the voters get to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down on, on how you're doing. And so I'm trying to make my case that you know, I am an appropriate candidate for this job. Uh, that's what this campaign has been. It's a very, very, very long job interview. And uh, on November 6th, I, I hope that uh, my performance review uh, bodes well. So that, that's all you can do. Well, Jack, it's, it's a pleasure meeting you. This is our first time meeting. Um, and, uh, and I wish you good luck. Thank you for letting us into of your course, home and, and doing that. And good luck, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm Greg Anderson. We'll see you next time.